I am honored to present today, or I guess introduce, she's presenting, I'm introducing, uh, Dr. Emma Bryant. Um, I've been following Emma's work on influence operations and in particular her uh, reporting and her research related to Cambridge Analytica um, and the military's use of uh, propaganda and psychological operations and information warfare techniques or whatever term it is they're using this week for, for those kinds of things. They keep changing their terminology. Uh, for, for literally years. So for me, I feel like I'm getting to meet a celebrity. Um, super excited to be able to bring her out here and have her speak with us today. So by way of background, if you don't know about Dr. Bryant's work, um, she researches to contemporary propaganda and information warfare, its governance in an age of mass surveillance, and its implications for democracy, security, inequality, and human rights. She's an associate at University of Cambridge Center for Financial Reporting and Accountability. Um, and a fellow at the Central European University Center for Media, Data, and Society. Um, she has particular research focus on the actors behind influence operations, which is what she's going to talk about today. Um, she analyzed the coordination and increasing impacts of the digita uh, digitization of defense propaganda for her 2015 book, Propaganda and Counterterrorism Strategies for Global Change. Her testimony drawing on that work was central to exposing the Cambridge Analytica scandal and continues to inform international inquiries and policy making, including in the United States Congress, the UK Parliament, the Canadian Parliament, and the European Parliament. She has advised politicians, NGOs, and technology companies on threats posed by the opaque digital influence industry, disinformation, um, and contemporary propaganda operations. She has served as an advisor for several documentary films, including some that you may have seen. Um, so a more recent one called People You May Know, which is streaming on Amazon Prime. Um, and she was a senior researcher for the Oscar shortlisted Netflix film called The Great Hack, which I highly recommend. It's very good. Um, she's finalizing her third book, uh, Propaganda Machine, Inside Cambridge Analytica and the Digital Influence Industry, as well as uh, co-editing the Rutledge Handbook on the Influence Industry with Vian Bakir of Bangor University in the UK. Um, and I have a chapter that I submitted for that and just got feedback on that I haven't read yet, so I need to read that and make those edits that you suggested. Um, Dr. Meyer regularly contributes journalism and op-ed pieces to major outlets and is owner of Maven of Persuasion LLC, a consultancy that advises and trains on disinformation threats and ethics in influence operations, influence industry. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Bryant and we will hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. Everyone. I'm really honored to be here with you all and thank you so much for coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the mercenaries of deceit uh, and understanding prop propaganda and what I call the digital dark arts because it sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not adverse to a little uh, spinning myself from time to time. So let's see what we're going to see in the, today's talk. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit in my background. Um, and I'm, I want to talk about this uh, whole last five years, the um, explosion of fake news or the explosion of people talking about fake news and calling it fake news and then getting confused and calling it about a billion other things. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the language and I offer a couple of uh, different terms that might help with understanding these, uh, these issues and concepts. Um, then I'm going to talk about how propaganda has become fragmented and commercialized and the industries that have emerged and the way that they, um, the way that they work and practice and how this is changing influence. And I'll talk through a little bit about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, especially aspects of it that you might not know so well. Um, I'll also sort of highlight how this came out of essentially military propaganda and the responsibilities there in, in relation to national security, both in terms of, um, you know, what should governments be doing ethically about these problems? Because there's a big old information war going on out there in case you hadn't noticed. And maybe that's part of why we've got all this fake news and all these other things that uh, we are struggling to understand going on in our Twitter feeds and so on. And so I'll then talk about how we need to 
kind of refocus around the actors behind these uh, operations. Um, this has been a bit of a bugbear of mine over the last five years, is actually that we are focusing very much on the nasty things that we see on the internet and how we dis dis just uh, that the effect that they are having and how this is causing problems in our world and try to, trying to retrospectively handle the problem from the consumer point of view, yeah, which is really important because it's affecting us all, but it's also kind of causing us to not be able to look at the causes of this issue and look at the people behind it who are responsible and it's very difficult to actually get to that part of the problem. So I want to talk a little bit about that and responsibility and holding people accountable and, and, and how we you know, tackle those kinds of problems. And a little bit about sort of the solutions or possible pathways towards developing solutions um, and how actually some of those that we have been chasing so far may not be you know, the answer may even have sometimes made things worse in some respects um, or exacerbated the problem. And so um, actually maybe we need to check our course and try again in some of this. And I'll uh, finish up there and, and see if you have any questions. So to begin, um, I, uh, I really have been peering into the propaganda machine for a while now. Um, I I started studying propaganda in 2003, <laughs> during the end of my bachelor's, <laughs> and I've been at it ever since, fascinated and probably a little bit obsessive by this point. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's just so always so fascinating to me uh, what's going on beyond what we see on our, in our everyday lives, the, the corridors of power and how, uh, how, how discourses in our um, that, that shape our world are, are, are um, influenced. So um, I started out really interested in this from a, a point of view of conflicts. And um, my first book is actually uh, Bad News for Refugees, which looks at um, how you know, the, the, the most vulnerable victims of war are misrepresented in the media. Um, I did my PhD looking at counterterrorism propaganda, which ended up as this book, Propaganda and Counterterrorism Strategies for Global Change, published in 2015. And for me, it's, it's, uh, it, was, it was really interesting to me how, these, um, how the governments of the United States and the UK were adapting to this new uh, environment where the... Um, where warfare was global, where war uh, propaganda was now instant uh, around the world. These narratives, the news would be spreading instantly. And terrorists were kind of exploiting this for recruitment. And, um, you know, th the start of my PhD really coincided with the Iraq war. And I was very angry, I suppose, about all the lies I could see we were being told in order to justify this. And so I was very interested in trying to understand both why people worked in this industry, both from, for governments, but also, you know, for the private companies that, you know, were making a heck of a lot of money. And by the way, that's part of it, <laughs> out of offering services. But, you know, how this ended up in, on our TV screens or in our, on our phones. Um, so I started to do a lot of high-profile interviews with, with, the, with kind of, um, uh, sorry, interviews with high-profile kind of uh, people in these governments. And um, it was really difficult work. So it's not very easy to go from being a PhD student in Scotland to <laughs> suddenly rocking up at the State Department or de Department of Defense saying, hey, can I interview you about your propaganda? <laughs> and they were surprisingly nice about it. Um, and it actually turned out to be far more complex <laughs> than I ever thought it was, as most PhD students mostly find about <laughs> whatever they take on. And um, I, uh, this is actually how I ended up meeting uh, SCL Group, which was the parent company of Cambridge Analytica. So this is one of their contracts with the, uh, the just describes the contract with the Department of State. 
Uh, so this, is, this was a defense contractor that was working on the war on terror that was um, you know, r running, doing kind of um, data analysis and uh, designing campaigns and things for the State Department to help them tackle things like extremism around the world. And this company at the end of the um, war on terror were struggling to get defense contracts. So it wasn't quite as lucrative in 2011 as it had been in 2003, four, five, yeah? And so they started to branch out and go into looking at, um, you know, working in politics a bit more, which is why they ended up setting up Cambridge Analytica. And at that point, I knew that people who were involved in working on these kinds of campaigns and decided I was really interested in how this company was now turning to work on the Brexit campaign and to the Trump campaign and so on. And using the same tools that it had uh, you know, prepared for tackling terrorism for working in quite extremist politics. So that um, I, I ended up doing a lot of um, interviews for, um, for my research around political campaigns. And at that point, the scandal was starting to, <laughs> to emerge. And I realized just how much, you know, information I had that was pertinent to these inquiries that were um, underway. And I was watching on TV as Alexander Nix was, was, um, was claiming one thing, that I had, I had actual evidence in my files for the opposite. You know, I could see them lying on TV. And um, I ended up uh, being asked to submit my research to the parliamentary inquiry in the UK uh, by um, the, uh, uh, the Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee on into fake news and disinformation. And that exploded my life <laughs> in a way I could never imagine. Um, uh, before that, I was a pretty normal professor who just uh, nobody would ever heard of. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, um, I, I did not expect the media blitz uh, that, that took over my life. It was crazy. And um, I ended up, uh, you know, struggling with a lot of difficulties as a result of this. But um, also, you know, having played a really important role in one of the most transformative, you know, uh, political communication research projects in the last, well, probably 10 years. You know, so it's, it's, it's been huge, you know. I ended up uh, the senior researcher behind this, this film, the, the Great Hack, which everybody had seen as well. Um, but also it meant that everybody started talking about after 2016 as well. I mean, that wasn't just me, obviously. There was a heck of a lot going on. People were talking about it already. But there was this big surge in the discussion around propaganda, but it wasn't that wasn't the word they were using. They were using fake news. You can see this here from, um, this is a great website which kind of compiles the data from all these different news organizations. And I used it to look at the, the discussion with MSNBC, CNN and Fox News of fake news from 2016 up to now. And you can see like this massive spike around the election. So everybody had questions. And we were trying to provide some answers. And, you know, a, a lot of other researchers were trying to take on this problem. So the language was part of the problem that was confusing everybody because you start talking about fake news. Is this really the problem? Well, probably it's not the problem. And it's, it's actually confusing to everybody. Um, and uh, so first draft actually, led the argument uh, to abandon that phrase and replace it with these terms misinformation and disinformation. Um, now, I, I tend to see this as a bit problematic, but you will be very familiar with these words, so I want to just tell you. Um, misinformation is unintended um, falsehoods online or in, in the news somewhere, yeah? So um, if you're accidentally getting something wrong, that's misinformation. And it's, uh, if it's deliberate falsehood, so you're telling lies, then it's disinformation. Um, now, the difference between these is obviously huge. Um, and this kind of 
dichotomy that was created is a bit of a false one. Um, but it, it sort of simplified the fake news debate for policymakers um, and attempted to tease this apart a little bit. And it was popular as, attempt to, as an attempt to make the propaganda problem out there, all this circulating troubling content of all the kinds, into a simple problem that we can sort of agree on. Yes, we all don't like false, th false things being there. Yeah. Um, and make it that sort of unpolitical, because we should be able to agree on the facts. But actually, this misunderstood an activity that has been going on for millennia. Um, so uh, propaganda, which is the deliberate kind of um, manipulation of representations, so media of any kind, um, with the intention of producing any effect in an audience. So that can be about inaction, action, reinforcing uh, feelings and behaviors, emotions, ideas. Um, and it's an intentional activity that is desired by the propagandist. So that might be self-serving. It might be paternalistic. So maybe I'm trying to manipulate you for uh, your own good. Yeah. <laughs> And states use many channels in order to influence audiences. So do politicians. Um, and they try to you know, get you to maybe think and feel and act a certain way, or maybe just try to create doubt and distrust. So I've put the picture here from RT, question more. This, uh, this somewhat dis disabling kind of narrative of like, well, actually, everything needs to be um, unpicked and, and you can't trust anything, there is no truth. Um, and, and propaganda, so this deliberate um, attempt to uh, shift somebody's beliefs, behaviors, and so on, and ideas, is, is one part of an influence operation. And disinformation is only one part of propaganda. Disinformation, remember, is the falsehood, the lies. Um, Influence operations are coordinated attempts to employ information collection, so gathering data, and an analysis, thinking about it and trying to organize it in some way, with organized distribution of propaganda or deception, um, and other forms of information advantage. So that could be all sorts of different um, operations that are aiming to achieve an actor's objective. Um, and, and an array of different entities that get involved in uh, both as distributors and as actors and agents behind and, and involved in, in the kind of campaigns. States, of course, are often behind this. Nonprofits also get involved and private industry and individuals. And one of the things I want to talk about today, the mercenaries of deceit, um, I, I have kind of defined this term of the digital influence industry. So this is private firms that are for hire out there as a service in deliberate and often coordinated and synchronized attempts by employing information collection and analysis with organized distribution of propaganda, deception, and other forms of information advantage to achieve a client actor's objectives. So it's a, it's a client-based industry, and uh, that is the business model, and that's kind of an important distinction. So within those operations, there is this thing, disinformation. Um, but that is only one kind of propaganda, and it's the intentionally false propaganda campaigns. Those, can, those kinds of propaganda are often used in synchronization with truthful information and sort of obscuring of, of the, um, the sources behind information as well. So gray propaganda. So um, those often are used in synchronization across a, a wide campaign in order to shape different audiences, actions and beliefs and so on in a, a, a coordinated way. Um, and the most, you know, most effective combination might be targeting you at any particular time. So it won't necessarily be disinformation that's moving you, 
but the same actor might well be using disinformation on somebody else. Or, um, you know, at different times, these, these may be used in coordination. So one example is, of course, uh, the Russian propaganda that has also used white, gray, and in combination with black propaganda dis in distorting and misleading ways, exaggerating and misrepresenting neo-Nazi elements, for example, in Ukraine to support this denazification narrative that we've seen uh, being used to you know, enable a genocide by demonizing and dehumanizing people um, and supporting this with a lot of disinformation and fakes. Uh, but there are may, many, many layers of infrastructure in order to deliver this. And one of the reasons that people are pulled into this stuff is because, um, you know, organizations like RT also sometimes put out articles that seem compelling and have, um, you know, truthful basis to them, which pulls people in. And then eventually, you know, you are also looking at <laughs> this kind of thing. So... Um, it's kind of a lot more complex than it seems. And these um, uh, different organizations might be working together where you don't necessarily see where they're coming from. And the way that um, modern, uh, like I said, fragmented and um, commercialized influence uh, works is actually has its kind of, um, uh, it, it seems to be sort of, um, based around the same model as what we saw years ago in the Cold War with the Manhattan Project. So this was the project to, to, to create the atomic bomb. Now, the way that they did this, essentially, because it was such a highly classified and vital to, to US national interests operation, is it had to be broken up and, and distributed across all these different scientists and organizations around America who were doing all of them a little, a tiny little bit of the project each. None of them could know about what the others were doing because that you know, would, would risk the entire project. And if one uh, scientist is compromised, then you know, it brings the whole thing down and the enemy has all of your secrets. So you break it up into little pieces. And this is kind of the way that a lot of this is working nowadays. There, there is a decentralization of propaganda. Um, and people use this kind of term of hybrid war, the way that this is being structured through um, our you know, civil society and so on. So there are ways of trying to um, uh, bring in um, uh, all sorts of different uh, organizations to uh, play a role. Now, we also see large amounts of, of like private industry um, being you know, uh, created out of uh, defense work that's been you know, uh, throughout the war on terror. Um, these kinds of uh, companies that were working for our governments during uh, you know, that whole period um, of the emergence of these like, technologies that were honing their skills in, uh, in conflict have set up in order to sell more broadly to, um, you know, for, for, to, to authoritarian countries, to big companies, to all sorts of different, anyone who will pay and often without much of an ethical compass. Um, so this uh, psychological operations and uh, intelligence gathering technologies have been weaponized to the highest bidder in hybrid wars, um, which uh, go beyond sort of advertising and disinformation. And I think those terms really don't quite grasp um, how coercive these kinds of technologies can be and how networked it all is. So, um, you know, these kinds of companies work together in coordination with other firms. Uh, there may be, um, uh, you know, use of, of data for compromat or for hacking and leaking information, which then is used for propaganda. So the coordination of these different activities in modern influence operations is really important. 
Which brings me to those mercenaries of deceit. What I call the digital influence mercenaries are a coercive subset of the digital influence industry. And um, I, I tend to think of these as, um, as, as uh, defined by, in two different ways. So either by their coercive clients offering that the, they're offering any influence services without discernment to state or non-state clients backed by force and coercion, especially uh, authoritarian clients and those violating human rights or using aggressive censorship or those engaged in or organized criminal activities. Um, and or, or by coercive me methods. So they might be offering or working with partners to enable for any client aggressive methods such as sourcing and using information via obtained via hacking, spyware, surveillance, black operations, um, blackmail, threats or incitement. Um, they might be using deception and it might include um, things like leading, developing and implementing state-backed destabilization strategies within civilian communities um, or falsely deflecting blame onto another target. So this kind of, um, of, of, of more coercive application of these kinds of technologies, I think deserves a separate category from the digital influence industry, which could um, actually be using um, methods that may not be so coercive and unethical, okay? Um, so this is beyond propaganda, this is information war. And it, it may well be up for higher for, for private clients as well. This is something that has come into our, our, our wider world out of warfare. Now these two, can, the digital influence industry and the digital influence mercenaries can be distinguished from things like clickbait. Uh, now clickbait is, is where you have like um, a bunch of kids in Macedonia who are gaming uh, Google's algorithms to create, you know, things that people click on a lot because it makes them money. And they will happily put out anything on any subject as long as it's, it could be, you know, memes about cats, yeah? It could be Trump uh, propaganda. It could be Clinton propaganda. It could be, you know, anything, okay? Whatever drives people an engagement, they will click on it because it makes them money, okay? And so those, they are... Um, kind of agnostic about the result of that. They don't really care about the result. And they are not working for a client. They're working for themselves, basically, and they do, they're not invested in the outcome. So this is a different business model to the digital influence industry, which works for clients, and, um, and digital influence mercenaries. In this, I differ with a bunch of other um, ac academics who've written around this. But I think this is a really important distinction. The image you have there is actually from my website, uh, propagandamachine.tech. And it's where I uh, mapped Cambridge Analytica on an interactive map that you can explore. You can uh, look at what they did around the world over a number of years, uh, working for different clients. And um, you can click on the different ones and, and get a news story about each different uh, campaign. Um, and uh, see, you know, not how, how they didn't just work in, you know, Brexit and Trump and so on. Some of their abuses were actually more uh, serious around the world in places where, you know, um, there are fewer protections for, uh, you know, the pu public. So I, I would encourage you to have a look. Um, also, so private firms like these then play a huge and very lucrative role in information warfare. Um, working for governments um, pays a heck of a lot of money. Look at that one billion contract to Periton, who are uh, you know working for the U U.S. government over a period of five years. That's just one company, like one deal, um, and that's not the only one, of course. So. Um, America is spending a heck of a lot of money on these firms. 
Now, um, some of them, they just work for governments. Um, some of them, they work for uh, only democracies, and that's great. <laughs> but uh, SCL group were clearly working for a lot of unethical people. And one of the things we, we struggle to, to know is actually when there's no transparency over the industry, what else they were up to. So in the Cambridge Analytica affair, um, we had uh, this company offering to, for instance, send some girls around to the candidate's house in order to catch him in a, you know, uh, a compromising situation and secretly film and so on. Um, there are all sorts of things that these people were setting up and working in politics. Uh, you also have things like the Kremlin spending on propaganda in the United States. Um, so they will hire these firms um, and declared spending alone by the Kremlin on propaganda within the US since 2016 amounted to more than 146 million to advance that country's interests. It's huge spend. Um, and that's not even the whole industry spent. That's just what is required by the US law in order to, to, to be declared. Um, with more overt out propaganda outlets like the Russian state-funded RT um, being suppressed, you also have other avenues for influence becoming more important. So pro proxy organizations that don't, aren't officially branded become more um, important to be able to get information out. So following on from, from thinking about how, um, how uh, these, the, the, um, these companies um, are profiting not only from working for our government, other governments, <laughs> and working in politics. This brings me to the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which I'm sure a lot of you know a little bit about already. I'm not going to go too heavily into the stuff that everybody probably knows. But just very briefly, we had this Cambridge University professor, um, Alice, Alexander Kogan, who created an app uh, that helped Cambridge Analytica to um, gather 87, up to 87 million Facebook profiles, the personal data um, of, of millions of people around the world in order to use in uh, elections. Um, eventually, they, of course, got fined. Um, but unfortunately, I think there's a lot that's not understood about this. Um, and what was most misunderstood, I think, is how Cambridge Analytica treated the data. And um, I think people get stuck between this thinking that um, either you know, they had all powerful kind of um, uh, super technology that uh, was able to um, you know, hack people's brains, or um, you know, actually it's all a load of snake oil and there's nothing to see here. <laughs> the truth is somewhere in between, as it always is. Um, but what they did, I think part, one of the most important things is actually just how unethical it was and how we very badly need to um, uh, make our systems much more secure in order to prevent this happening. Because regardless of whether or not we can prove whether it elected John Trump or did this or did that, um, what, what was happening is just plain wrong. So um, their methodology definitely focused around this ocean um, personality test, um, which measures, um, we all have um, an ocean score, okay? These are not like bad things about your personality or, or anything like that. If you're one of these or another of these, this is just humans. And the ocean personality test is used by a lot of companies and is, um, is used by the US government as well. It's a normal personality test. Um, and we're all somewhere on this scale. But um, what they did is they mapped this onto um, an awful lot of data, but including Facebook profiles. One of the ones that they um, found most useful in their ana analysis was actually neuroticism because of what they were trying to do with, with politics in the US. Now, um, if you want to use Ocean for um, targeting your ads for selling dog food, it may well not be that useful, okay? Um, there's, 
there's a debate around how effective, how much better it, it makes your ads than using another form of analysis based on this, this kind of surveillance data. Um, but what they did find, they did a, a lot of experiments around targeting fear-driven messaging to neurotics. And they were practicing on thousands of Americans um, experiments where they were driving different types of ads around like Hillary Clinton and messaging around Hillary Cl Clinton. And the stuff that was really scary, scary worked much more um, uh, effectively on people who had a neurotic personality trait uh, as dominant. And this created about a 20% increase in, um, in engagement and activated people. Um, and so I think when, when you talk about like effectiveness, it's important to understand what you're using it for. Not every tool is helpful for every problem. But for this problem of how we drive ads for Trump or sell guns for the NRA or Actually, it might be quite useful to know who's a neurotic and to know that actually it's, it's going to create, you know, spike engagement. Um, so then you have, you, you upload your list of people to the Facebook um, uh, website who you know are, are neurotics. And then, of course, Facebook has its lookalike audience audiences feature where it will go and find people who seem like these people. And so it spreads. You have now managed to get your message out to a heck of a lot of very paranoid people, probably. Um, now, there's nothing wrong with you if you're neurotic, but you are probably more prone to stress and anxiety than other people, OK? So, <laughs> um, so I, I think this really matters and that this kind of messaging is a, a kind of uh, tactic is really kind of unethical. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to use ocean for other things, but it maybe means that we need to think through what's permissible around this kind of data use. Um, so this brought me to working with um, some folks uh, on, on a really amazing film I hope you'll check out, People You May Know. Um, and I was one of the researchers on this with Brent Allpress, who's the main the lead researcher. And my, um, my work on this with them uh, was, my, my role was more focused on Cambridge Analytica, but uh, they were looking very much at this project involving churches and the way that they were micro-targeting uh, for bringing people to the church all around America. So this organization, which um, coordinates conservative philanthropy, the Philanthropy Roundtable, hired Cambridge Analytica, as well as um, this other organization called Glue, which um, makes uh, Christian apps, uh, to, for, on a data project, basically, which was to establish a um, an app for uh, helping churches to reach out to their communities, to bring people into the church, but also to deliver advertising and services and things like, you know, they would, you know, do things like um, helping people who are approaching divorce potentially, um, who are in relationship stress, what they call relationship stress, um, and may be in danger of divorcing because they want to keep families together. They wanted to, you know, they were looking at things like uh, people in crisis, financial crisis, people who are suffering from addictions and things like that, uh, trying to deliver services through the church. But, uh, so this, may, this included support for vulnerable groups. And that meant that the app was pulling in data about stress and anxiety and depression and all these like really sensitive subjects. Um, and of course, um, it then uh, Brent Allpress managed to discover that this app was being resold by uh, the, these, these people for political campaigns. Now, um, you know, obviously this is like a, a mispurposing of the data. A lot of the churches had no idea, you know, that this was being done. And, um, you know, this is people's, you know, private information and it's very dangerous. Um, 
so uh, he, f he found that this was a project of the Council for National Policy, um, which uh, is an umbrella organization and networking group for high level conservative activists. Um, and um, it's also linked to the Stop the Steal campaign. Um, uh, Anne Nelson has done a fantastic book called Shadow Network, which I recommend as well. And I was working on researching this with these guys. Brent um, discovered initially that they were marketing it to all these different kind of industries. Um, but my, my data has, has found that this kind of church data that they were um, using was being modeled politically by race into Cambridge Analytica's 2016 um, political campaign survey. So they were, they were proposing questions to be put out with their political surveys that were then being used for the political campaigns. Um, and that Cambridge Analytica, um, uh, the, it was actually Alexander Nix who raised this to be action by those handling the political research um, uh, and uh, undertaken for free, including uh, demographic, demographic and personality segmentation. Um, the Cambridge Analytica were also paid to run a heck of a lot of ads um, for this. So um, the, obviously these kinds of ocean ocean uh, modeling was being applied in this particular example too. And then um, uh, the um, uh, Cambridge Analytica were also running a uh, campaign for Make America Number One pack called Crooked Hillary. So this is the one that was linked to voter suppression and conspiracy driven kind of content and this um, use of neuroticism uh, for targeting fear. Um, and this was also trying to kind of um, uh, focus on people who were, um, uh, who, who were um, uh, religious, they were modeling it by religion. So this kind of data was obviously going to be so a very great use in this particular campaign. Um, so it brings us to the kind of question of like, well, what's our responsibility here? And should we actually be, um, more coming from the audience perspective. A lot of people point to the disinformation problem and say, well, isn't this just these stupid people who are <laughs> engaging in it? And there's a lot of um, reporting that blames the people who are consuming the information um, for, for just not seeing through it. And at the very least, um, you know, people ask, well, will digital literacy solve it? Can we just educate people a bit more and they'll see beyond it? But unfortunately, um, these are really quite complex influence operations being run by sophisticated actors who often aim to manipulate uh, mistrust around you know, uh, these kinds of um, uh, issues in society that mean so much to people. Um, that have real foundations, such as the lies that enabled the Iraq war, um, real corporate cover-ups and spin, and, you know, issues by when, you know, the government lies about something, which it does from time to time, you know, politicians who you don't feel you can trust. There's all sorts of things in this world that are, you know, genuinely um, misleading. And so it, people, um, I think, very often it's, it's easy to... Um, become very, you know, um, uh, disengaged from politics and so on by these things and paranoid and, and it's very easy to kind of manipulate people with um, a, a sense that actually it's, it, you know, they don't know who to trust. Um, and it, that is the real problem is the inability to know what, when and whom to trust um, in an environment where you, you have examples in front of you all the time of very real things that, um, you know, we, we, that prove that we can't trust a uh, mainstream media organization or, a, you know, whatever it might be. And some of the solutions that are pro proposed aren't helping. Um, it's not just stupid people. It's, you know, as you can see with these two examples I've presented here, educated people are vulnerable too because they know <laughs> that there are people out there manipulating things. And this makes you more, um, you know, critical and trying to read beyond it. But then, you know, what do you trust? It can be very difficult to know. 
Um, so ill thought through measures um, that uh, governments have been trying to use to tackle the problem, I think also have uh, had the counter effect. You know, often these are very well-meaning and not necessarily doing anything that has, has been ac accused of them. Um, you know, there's a heck of a lot of misrepresentation and hype in order to try to close down efforts to try and solve these problems. And um, the person who was in charge of the disinformation governance board that was set up short, a short time ago that only was in existence for three weeks um, got uh, harassed across the internet, um, really very horribly misogynistically trolled because she headed up this organization that was trying to solve the problem. Now, personally, I think setting up a disinformation governance board is not the answer to this because that kind of response is, is predictable and it's going to be used to, um, you know, turn this into another conspiracy theory, yeah? And um, I think we need to be avoiding these kinds of um, uh, 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 answers to the problem that, that fuel the mistrust. Now, this week, the Pentagon has joined Canada in needing to review its shady uh, digital age propaganda operations. Um, the, uh, a, a sweeping review of their clandestine uh, psyops. Um, and there's a need to regulate private industry firms that have been rolling this out. I, I showed you that slide, a billion going to one company. And what are they doing, these different companies? You know, a lot of them, uh, according to the reporting this week, are producing grey propaganda. Well, it might often have a, uh, a, a message that's true. So a lot of it, it might be producing the same kind of narratives that are um, put out by, you know, um, uh, America's... Um, public diplomacy um, that's, that's uh, branded uh, by the US government. Um, but it's being put out through shady websites that are fake or AI generated personas on Twitter or, or whatever, um, you know, media form. And this actually ends up, you know, destroying confidence. Um, these posts were not as engaging as the stuff that was US branded. <laughs> So the idea that it was actually um, helping to deal with a problem where uh, people won't engage with the message because they're put off by it coming from the US government, um, you know, is actually often undermined by the fact that these things are very clearly the US government. If you're seeing some website that's putting out the US message, um, it, it doesn't take a genius to work out where that's come from, yeah? So people don't necessarily believe this stuff anyway. And we really need to be starting to think about, well, if we want to build public trust in our institutions again after a real major crisis, um, we need to also answer questions like, how light is our gray, okay? Are we doing this right? Um, is this the best way to um, run a propaganda effort that's meant to be trying to um, you know, uh, fight in a, an in information war for, the, for democracy. Um, governments are developing now AI-driven ways of identifying disinformation by behavior online um, and fighting these MDM, so um, misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, um, uh, information wars. Um, with rising distrust, they're also moving underground and becoming less transparent. So using these personas and fake accounts to put out what is often truthful, but like sometimes perhaps not so. Um, and in interview, um, my, uh, I, uh, the former um, uh, director of communications division at NATO, Mark Leighty, told me, grey is honest, truthful, propaganda, but you may not say who or where it's coming from. And to some degree, the whole of the communications arena in, in relation to, um, especially in relation to kind of governments, um, is now gray. So the ethical question becomes, how light is your gray? Democracies need to be considering limits and ethical boundaries for our own propaganda. 
as it evolves if we want to undermine authoritarian efforts to exploit the distrust that is pulling our societies apart. And only trust building will counter these conspiracies. Um, now, it might be that in some situations, we, uh, for, for very narrow purposes involving you know, um, uh, uh, terrorist groups and so on, you may well need to use you know, deceptive practices. But for the mass fakery that is being put out, this is, this is not helping, I think, anybody. Um, and we need to start reshaping these kinds of responses. Um, making misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation, this um, new concept, the center of the problem, um, has, has, has really backfired, I think. Um, we are finding, you know, basically the, the US government has been trying to identify things based on what posts are false on, and what aren't, and then responding to all of these as a threat. Now, uh, that means that misinformation, the, the accidental falsehood, is also wrapped up into being a threat. And this, I think, has, has really concerning implications for free speech. Rolling this up in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a, in a theoretical framework um, with malign actors uh, like the Russian uh, IRA is a very concerning kind of modeling. And it's no wonder people are expressing concern about these kinds of methods. I'm concerned. <laughs> so um, I think that we need to think through what, how, we're, how we're doing this in order to build public trust and and um, an and investment in what's the solutions to the problem. And we're not tackling the people behind it. So the um, influence industry is something we also are using in these operations. Um, it, it does reputation laundering. There are shell companies behind these firms often. You know, that may even include sort of um, uh, bags of cash and or dark crypto transactions taking place. There's very little regulation around these things. Dark money, hidden lobbying that takes place, use of covers, uh, fake identities, generic company names covering up what, what, you know, what a company is uh, linked to, um, fracturing work between different entities, some of which might be non-profits um, used for profit, uh, political purposes or something. Use and abuse of different jurisdictions around the world as well, because something is, is legal here, not there, so we'll fly over here and do it. So this kind of thing is obviously really problematic. And there's very, without any you know, um, regulation of the industry, like some of this may sometimes be coming up against the law, or maybe on the edge of it, or maybe some of it's perfectly legal. But without you know, really looking at how all of this is coming together, we are not really tackling the problem of deliberate activities on these platforms. Um, that is all stuff that Facebook can't see happening. So asking these companies to be the main point of response is um, actually really unhelpful. Um, they definitely have a role to play, and we maybe do need to have them doing content moderation, taking things down that are spreading around the world, but actors who influence and their motives have become an afterthought. And this kind of um, problem of identifying these actors behind the campaigns is one that we're just not even really dealing with at the moment, because it's too hard to solve. And um, you know, people have focused on this, uh, this, this problem of the falsehood. But um, both uh, foreign and domestic campaigns can look the same on the surface. And foreign actors deliberately adopt domestic narratives or try to look like groups in order to, you know, get people to fight each other, yeah? So you had the Blue Lives Matter um, and Black Lives Matter uh, being set up by the Russians in 2016, uh, pages, to try to you know, amplify what they saw happening in American society as into a, into, into a, a, a battle between, uh, between people 
um, if, you, if you liked these pages, you would get a whole load of really concerning propaganda that was trying to um, get people out onto the streets, agitating, trying to you know, make um, actually protests not be normal protests that are trying to get people to help with their civil rights movement or whatever um, they want to achieve, but actually to try to make a protracted um, uh, you know, conflict within the society that doesn't resolve those problems, deliberately to not resolve those problems, actually. And I think this is one thing that people don't quite understand sometimes, is they're like, look at something, and I'm like, well, that's fine. That doesn't look like it's a problem. Um, you know, why, why is it a problem that there's a Black Lives Matter page or whatever, who owns it? Um, uh, I, it's up to me if I'm engaging with that content or not or whatever. But if it's actually aiming to not help you make progress, um, then actually it's, it's, it's absolutely against your interests. And you might not be able to see what's happening with that page over time. There may well be a plan behind the construction of that page, which is meant to take it in a particular direction. And so this sort of thing is impossible to, 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 um, to, to respond to or understand just by looking at the surface. And you miss the motives and the actors uh, if you conflate these different issues. Um, it also, like I said, treats misinformation as part of the same problem, and it can risk free speech. History warns us against overly expansive definitions of participation in propaganda, which um, imp embrace the targets of propaganda as active in their own subversion. Um, the public being targeted aren't the uh, problem there, they're the victims. And Yes, they have a responsibility, we all do, for how we engage online. And we need to create an internet that helps us to behave in better ways and doesn't incentivize us to go trolling and to, you know, at the moment social media makes us feel like we, we want to behave in certain ways that are antisocial, really, and, and harassing. But um, it, it also is, is that case that powerful actors, companies, you know, governments are creating this in this way. So um, what can we do as human beings navigating on the web at this moment in time? Well, it's limited, I'm afraid. I don't see a, a whole load of uh, wonderful solutions um, because you can't see what's behind these hybrid campaigns that are all the way through our, our, our lives. They're not just uh, on Facebook. It's, that might be linked to this and, and something else. Um, but what you can do is, is to secure your privacy. I recommend having a look at Tactical Tech's uh, Data Detox Toolkit and campaigning as loudly as you can for privacy um, laws in the United States. Um, I, I, you also you know, should be interrogating your own ideological bias and emotions as you read anything online. If something is feeling like it's um, something that you believe in immediately and are engaged by, have a think about what the article is, is uh, appealing with to you and the actual factual information behind it. Go check that out. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's not necessarily um, something that uh, applies to just stuff that seems misleading. Okay, that's, you should do that with all news, all, all information online, because all of it is trying to engage us in different ways. And actually, we are at our weakest in terms of interrogating things that feel right, for, right to us. Um, so uh, yes, especially pause before you share raw and identified accounts that seem truthy. So a lot of the stuff around Ukraine at the moment, obviously there's, there's stuff all over the place that looks really upsetting. And um, you know, it's really very important to think about like, well, has this been verified yet before you share things? Um, the, also the issue of the mainstream media versus this alternative media that has risen up is, a, is an important issue because we, a lot of us, um, get into thinking about propaganda not because uh, just of, because of the, um, the the political campaigns, but because we we are concerned about biases in mainstream media, 
And a lot of people then end up going to alternative media, um, which may well also have its own biases. And sometimes, you know, the, um, uh, the practices of journalism uh, in those organizations may well not be as developed. So they may, you know, maybe are they, are they actually even doing right to replies with uh, people will they do a story on or an organization they do a story on? Are they <laughs> accepting hacked materials? Are they, um, you know, putting out things that, uh, you know, they, they have got from, from sources that can't really be trusted? You don't know. Now, that, that also applies sometimes to mainstream media that may, may well have problematic practices where they are being influenced by the fact that they are, uh, you know, run through advertising. They have powerful uh, relationships to, um, uh, you know, PR companies and p people in politics and so on. And, and both often have a, an ideological bias. But we need to remember that actually, um, you know, one isn't a solution to the other. Like, so I think um, things are missing from the mainstream news that, that do <laughs> end up on other sites that are small. But that doesn't mean that everything um, in the mainstream media is, is wrong. And it also doesn't mean everything that's in alternative media is wrong just because sometimes that's misleading. I think we need a much more careful approach to thinking about media and thinking about the different... Um, uh, biases and methodologies of different media organizations um, and, and who's behind them and how they're funded too. Um, so sometimes marginal voices actually can be marginal for a reason. And I think that fear of something being left out of the news or, or the dominant view necessarily being uh, something that's, that's there only because of the powerful is, is a problem that we're facing right now uh, because it's very hard to know whether something is suppressed or, or, or just not very good, useful information. Um, and, and a lot of that is also about the type of experts that are being put forward. Um, have a look when it's somebody, Dr. So-and-so, who's saying this. Are they a doctor in the thing that they are, are giving an opinion on? That's, that's an important one, because a lot of the time people haven't been with the, the, the opinions that are being shared in some of this stuff that circulates. Um, understanding as well how your uncertainty can be weaponized. We're all a little bit worried <laughs> about all sorts of different things. So when you're feeling fearful, that's when you should think most carefully. Um, and understanding how the, the lies, the truth, and the the slight fakery of the, the source, um, work together to amplify some marginal issues and the extreme cases into misrepresenting a problem. So yes, there might be a few cases of this that sounds worrying, but does that mean that we should like totally and utterly change our entire behavior? Maybe not, okay, calm down. <laughs> you know, at least until you've checked out like just how big a problem this is. Because often, like for instance, with terrorism, we had, you know, instances where um, there was like one extreme case of like a really terrifying thing happening. So in the UK, we had a, um, a, a guy who was fighting um, to, to, get, um, uh, to, to, uh, to get asylum as a, a, and he was a terrorist. Now, in, in the UK, like refugee law does not require you to let in a terrorist as um, as a refugee, okay, um, and so this, but the the right wing media blew this into a huge thing of like actually we need to stop all refugees because one terrorist is trying to manipulate the law. Or, so so you get very often these very partial small cases being used to um, try to remove the rights of a heck of a lot of people. Um, so understanding proportionality is also really important. And, and also thinking about how to make yourself and you know, raise awareness in the scholarly community around how um, social engineering is used. This is another aspect of, um, of, 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 I think, vulnerability in this day and age, how um, powerful actors are actually targeting um, experts. And I think all uh, scholars need to be aware of this, and, and new PhD students 
need training on how to um, spot when they are being approached by these kinds of people. This was something that was happening during the Cambridge Analytica um, uh, affair. It's something that you know happened Russian and um, uh, Chinese and, and all these different kind of state actors do. They try to um, you know recruit people from academia in order to um, uh, develop um, relationships that will be useful with useful experts and so on. And I think this is a really important problem that we are not really handling yet. Um, you know, and it's important that universities handle this because uh, what we don't want is government spying on, on, on intellectuals and things like this. This would be really worrying. So I think it's really important that all of us take on the responsibility of starting to train and raise an awareness around these issues. Um, and to stand by people who are defending democracy. One thing um, that was a real um, uh, you know, uh, enlightening experience for me during this whole affair was actually being targeted online and um, receiving death threats like this one, <laughs> um, which wasn't fun. Um, and uh, I, th I think it's really important to kind of raise awareness around how uh, threats aren't just received by journalists, they're also received by academics who are doing work on propaganda and especially women and minorities. Um, so anyway, sorry, I think I might have even gone over time. I hope not. Okay. Um, well, uh, you're not just an audience for my persuasion, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, I, I pulled up uh, while you were talking, and forgive me, I just pulled up the, the pointer report. I think they started it a few years ago, and they keep adding to it, of what specific countries are doing. Um, to engage misinformation, whether that's actually putting folks in prison, like Saudi Arabia's uh, yeah. five-year policy, or increasing fines, or having you know civil action um, accessibility. I'm wondering, based on like the list that you provided of things that can be done, um, and some of what you said, like does any of that r really work? Like these punitive approaches that some countries are trying, does it work? Because the Pointer Report also says at some point like there are many countries that are just saying it's just where we're at now like they don't want to engage the problem because they think it'll amplify like by going in on let's say here in the u.s like um some right far right wing folks that that'll just amplify uh, the voice to that like i'm just wondering what you've seen or what you think about the best approach i think i think i think approaches need to be proportionate and um, yes, you can make things worse by meddling, you know, sometimes. Um, and I think, um, so one thing that I've seen happening in some cases is governments trying to marginalize these communities that are extreme and move them away from the mainstream. Um, and in some ways, it's important that, you know, we kind of raise awareness of the fact that actually what they're saying isn't true and um, you know try to to move people away from it but um, at the same time you know actually you see these folks radicalized by this because they're moving into a more and more condensed group that becomes really problematic actually and vulnerable itself to being uh, targeted by other even worse groups. So I, I think that sometimes this kind of thing can, can really make problems that are worse than when, when, when they started. And I think, you know, often those communities then go underground and you can't even monitor the problem or, you know, see what's going on then. Um, so yeah, I think actually governments have, have actually been messing up a lot of this quite badly. And I think by the very public, um, problematic responses like you know looking too heavy-handed you know like the the you know go uh, disinformation governance board was just a really bad idea to yes we need a, an answer to this but it needs to come from civil society responding you know people like us actually not governments uh, you know putting out messages that that's just gonna make people more paranoid I think personally. So I think, yes, um, it, it, I think sometimes 
governments need to do something in some cases, but it should be transparent. They need to be telling us what they're doing and why in order for it to build some kind of uh, consent from society, you know, for what they're doing. Um, I, I think in the context of war, it's maybe slightly different when there are, you know, like actual, you know, terrorist groups or, you know, there's a, there's a genocide going on. And we, we, yes, we want to respond to that in a way that, you know, occasionally, sometimes, um, you know, there may be, if you're looking at a targeted, very specific group, um, you know, ways of responding that, that use deception might be necessary. But there is no way on earth they should be doing things that look even vaguely shady um, for wider populations around the world uh, or, or domestically. And I think the trouble is that looking like you have set up a propaganda entity for domestic um, campaigns, even though it's not doing that, you're creating a bigger problem than where you started. Um, the stuff that this week broke, um, that was all foreign. That was targeting foreign audiences, not American audiences. Um, and it was using these kind of um, fake accounts and so on. Um, I, that also backfires, this kind of thing, because you have, like you say, other countries who then set up uh, their own fake news patrolling organizations and mirror this, but obviously doing it even more unethically. Uh, but it gives a kind of a sense that how actually we're fine to do this now. Um, and I think that um, if, if they actually want to solve these problems, they have to be way more transparent about what they're doing, why. Um, and the same thing with the platforms. You know, if you're taking things down, you have to tell people why you've taken this down. Don't just stick a load of rant, you know, general policies up, um, you know, because it's, it's actually counterproductive. It, people see it and see censorship and they don't understand why because you're not properly explaining exactly why that post or that account was taken down. Um, it's not good enough to just say spam and harassment or, you know, like something like this. Um, it's, tell people what that account was doing, why it was bad, you know, but they're not doing that on the platforms either. And we're not seeing, you know, enough transparency over things like, you can make it visible who is behind a lot of these operations online and so on. I mean, that's not really uh, information available yet. You know, the platforms don't share everything they know about companies and, and, and uh, organizations that are putting out these campaigns. So there's a lot that needs to be done, but it's, it just needs to be more careful and, and intelligent, the responses, I think, because otherwise they can backfire. Very interesting to talk about like mainstream media and alternative media. And I think that's because I, I think of myself as somebody who runs like an alternative media platform like, like of some sort. And we kind of try to tell minority stories like, like across Africa, right? And I, I want to hear from your perspective what do you think is a great thing for, I guess, alternative media owners or founders to do to sort of grow readers' trust or like ah. embolden readers' think, or this is a credible platform that is actually. I mean, I, I would think all platforms have like propaganda, maybe, I don't know. But like, what what's a great way to sort of communicate the clarity yeah. of that? And also, if you have any like media platforms that you think actually do it, alternative media platforms that you think do it the right way. I think saying who you who funds you, you know, or how you raise your funding, um, and why not have a page on how you um, you know your your journalism ethics policy? Like, how do you do your your journalism? There's no reason why you shouldn't spell out for people, you know, like, this is our, our, our belief in how you do good journalism. And we follow these practices, journalism practices. I mean, uh, the, a lot of journalism organizations, large or German, journalism organizations do that. And, um, you know, obviously, there's also things like, um, you know, if, if anybody should complain about something, responding in a way where you, you know, if you're making a correction, you make that visible. And you, you show if you're updating a, a, a website, for instance, when it was last updated, and so on. That kind of thing is important for transparency. So I think those kinds of things will help people build trust in your organization. 
I have a question for you. So with advocating media literacy, especially with some of these topics that are a little bit darker and deeper, what are some ways that we can help individuals that might, um, to educate individuals, I should say, um, and bring awareness to others with the potential risk of being viewed as a conspiracy theorist? Because I know sometimes people will say, oh, that's just, you're just being negative, or sometimes they won't want to look at the data. So in essence, having a conversation mm -hmm. to encourage others to pay more attention and to be smarter about their privacies. Um, I mean, it really depends on that person, doesn't it, a little bit. Um, and I think, quite honestly, that these are conversations that are better to have either one-to-one -one or in small groups and things like that. It's the same with anything. So, I mean, I was involved for a while in, in, tr in trying to uh, respond to problems of um, racism and um, uh, refugees who had come into the community and trying to help integration in a community where there was a lot of transition happening. And, you know, um, uh, there were a, a lot of, like, white locals who were really kind of angry at the changing demographics of the place. And, you know, uh, one of the groups that I was speaking to used to run these, like, safe space discussions in the community where, you know, they would actually bring together some of these refugees and, and uh, local people who um, uh, were, I had questions, genuine questions, actually. And I think, you know, a lot of that kind of dialogue is really necessary to get through these barriers, because what you're talking about is an emotional barrier. It's not really about they haven't got the information because they don't want to hear it because that's challenging to their f feelings about something, yeah, and their views. So you have to get beyond the feelings. And in order to do that, you have to connect with them as a human being. <laughs> and it's hard to do that online, unfortunately. So I don't think that's like about putting out mes messaging that will persuade them. That is just not going to work unless we tackle this on a you know, human basis uh, in our communities. That's why, you know, getting out and talking to community groups, that kind of thing is really important. Um, and I think, you know, the more people start to recognize this through society, you know, the more we can bring more people on board. But I think actually a, a lot of people are really aware now that these governments are and, you know, politicians and so on are um, manipulating data and that there are companies out there that are surveilling them and so on. But what they don't know is, is really, it, it's, it's very difficult to tangibly see how that affects you. And I think that's a problem I still don't have really an answer for <laughs> because it's, it is just very difficult to ha see how that affects you personally, directly, how your data being sucked out of this computer right now is um, going to affect you in tomorrow, the next day, three weeks, a year's time, or whatever. It, 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 it's hard to get your head around that, which is kind of why we, uh, we aren't the answer. <laughs> because none of us can imagine how the next uh, Alexander Nix is going to abuse our data or, or you know, how the, the Russians or you know, whoever it might be are going to. And, um, so what we need to do is to make uh, an online environment that um, where no, no actors can um, use this technology in this kind of way, actually, because it's not just about the Russians or about Cambridge Analytica. It's about having an ability to navigate safely. And we shouldn't have to make sure your friend understands it, like, because, you know, if, if, if it's going to come down to that, then Honestly, I think it's uh, we're going to lose the battle <laughs> um, because everyone isn't going to really understand those implications. Even intelligent people who, you know, get that there are problems don't really grasp, I think, just how big this can be in terms of shaping our world and what it does. Yeah. Yeah, and especially I was thinking in the classroom as well as younger and younger ages of children that are using social media that are sharing information, whether it's online or just talking about it as if it is real. Yeah. So I feel like there's, and I loved what you said about connecting with people on a human level. I think. 
Yeah, and the, the trouble is that, um, I mean, a lot of people are aware of it now, but getting them to do something is another matter because there's a lot of apathy. You know, there's a lot of like, oh, what can I do? You know, it's, it's, oh, it's just a big problem that's bigger than me. And so I'm just going to keep watching Netflix and not worry about it, even changing my settings because like I have to, I've, you know, I have to live in this world and everything is spying on me. So, you know, the, the magnitude of the problem also shuts people down. And, you know, that's why it, I mean, I, I do encourage you all to do all of the things with the privacy, you know, but at the same time, that's not going to be the answer to it. Okay. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for doing this really crucial work and doing it in a public facing way. The harassment and all of that is it's really impressive. I have a question about method, um, largely because I have no idea how you like go about learning all of this. And so I know, I know you, you, know, you mentioned interviews, and so I get that part of it. But like putting together the interactive map of Cambridge Analytica, could you just talk more about your process for doing this kind of work, pulling all the pieces together, accessing data? What's your, what's your approach? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, quite honestly, um, like I said, I got launched into like crazy land um, overnight. And researching through this has been hard. Um, the main methodology I use is interviewing. Um, but I think that, you know, I realized that, you know, I, if I just publish this stuff in an academic way, it's going to take two years for a paper to publish. Um, you know, and maybe maybe even longer, yeah. Um, and the the, the 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 information needed to come out into the world. So, I have prioritised that and been an engaged scholar, who, quite honestly, um, probably should have been, <laughs> for career purposes, focusing on getting <laughs> into Journal of Communication <laughs> with it. Um, but instead was like talking to filmmakers and producing the website with the d data journalism project kind of thing. And that is built on, because of the risks to me, I used only uh, publicly reported um, campaigns of, of Cambridge Analytica or stuff that was on their website that I know is def it definitely happened. I've corroborated it in some way. So. Um, so that is, I think, you know, the key for, for kind of constructing that, that sampling. And then um, that isn't all of their campaigns, but it is a huge amount of them. And I, it was me plus um, s some of my students and a, um, a, a data scientist who volunteered his time and uh, didn't wish to be named, but, you know, um, uh, was really very kind in um, in helping me to correct, to put the data set together in in the right way that would uh, then be possible to visualize with the mapping and you can explore the world in terms of what they did um, and I, I encourage you to have a look at it through a computer not necessarily on your phone because it doesn't work as well on mobile but um, that I I, th I mean, I, I just felt really compelled to try and tell a different story to what I was seeing in the media because it frustrated me so greatly that I, I, I was trying to get the message out about Cambridge Analytica, but the nature of mainstream media is it focuses on the story of the day. And so that was Trump. And so this ended up being the focus, not the industry, the the, the came, the, the companies behind it, not uh, the rest of the work that they were doing around the world in these vulnerable democracies. And I felt that that totally distorted the picture. So I wanted to create a website that really sort of got to this problem and visualized it in a way that was different to what was coming out through the media. And I, I, it managed to get like quite a lot of attention um, when I published it, but it's really hard getting stuff out there that challenges the, you know, uh, the main story and, and tries to correct it and, and, and change direction a little. Um, and, and that's what I've been trying to do in different ways, because um, if I had just published a paper, that wouldn't have had the same kind of effect. Um, 
doing the 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 book that I've been working on, I've also, you know, obtained a heck of a lot of documents. And, you know, my methodology has really been just, you know, um, triangulating all this information from all these different sources and checking things. And there is a lot that's like um, they put out that was misleading as well. So you have to be incredibly careful to get beyond their own claims about, look, both, that both pretended they weren't doing things that were unethical that they were and also that amplified the things that they were doing that were more effective than they actually were so in some ways they were presenting themselves as like actually we're not really that important and we're not really doing bad things and then the next minute they're actually oh actually we do really bad things and we're really <laughs> you know so so try to find like some some truth between all of this was really very difficult um, but I'm very grateful to whistleblowers, people behind my research who, um, you know, weren't wanting to get media attention and be, you know, um, known in, in the whole story. Um, and, and who really helped me to get a better, deeper understanding of what was really going on behind this. Talking to governments, talking to, um, you know, uh, journalists and people affected by the the scandal has been really illuminating as well. Um, but I, I think also things like, you know, p insiders sharing internal information really made a difference to me because these companies present themselves one way publicly and you cannot trust what's in their public statements. And I think a lot of the Cambridge Analytica reporting um, rested on those public statements, which were either exaggerated or covering things up. And you have to get like into their internal world in order to see really what was going on in the company. And uh, that, that kind of deep research is vital. And, and Cambridge Analytica offers us the first and only opportunity to see a company case study example in that kind of real deep depth that I've ever seen. I've never seen this happen before, that, that an example has been of the industry has been opened up so so uh, transparently. And I think we need a lot more insight into how these companies operate. I want to know how many Cambridge Analyticas there are in the world. So this has shaped my onward work. And at the moment, I'm trying to do another data-driven kind of project where I'm mapping the influence industry. So not just one company, I'm trying to do like a whole big subset of that industry and looking at their human rights uh, record, looking at disinformation and uh, you know, data use and things like that, and trying to get a f figure out like, just how extensive these problematic practices are within a wider industry, you know, th so that we can try to think about policy responses and ways to try and encourage a more ethical industry, actually, because there are also good companies out there who aren't doing bad things, yeah? So, um, Actually, we need to think about like, well, how do we encourage more of that and less of this? <laughs> and we don't have the data at the moment to do that. Policymakers don't have the data. So, um, I mean, I'm trying to at the moment um, figure out how to fund this bigger project, which, you know, is quite ambitious, but exciting. <laughs>